I'm Jack Harrington, a principal full stack engineer, and in this JavaScript quick fix, we are going to take a look at destructuring, particularly in the context of an array reduce method, and how just a little bit of difference in how you write it can make a huge difference in performance. Have a look at this graph, and we're going to see how one variation of the code can give you this red line, which is bad news, and another variation of the code, which does exactly the same thing, can give you the blue line, which is far more efficient. Let's jump right into the code. All right, so what I have here is a list of people, and what we wanna do is create a lookup from this. So we're gonna go and create an object from this array where, for example, a key with ID one is going to have the value of this person, ID two is gonna have this, and so on and so forth. This is very common, and we do this stuff a lot. And reduce is a great method for doing that. So let's try it out. We'll do people.reduce, and it takes a starting value, so we're gonna create an object, so I will start with an object. And now our reduce is going to take a lookup, and we're gonna take the person, and what we're gonna do is return an object. So I'll put that in parentheses, and then we are going to destructure lookup into that new object. And then we're going to take person.id as the key and point it at person. And we can see using Quaka that this has actually created the output that we're looking for. You have an object where one maps to that person object. So this is great stuff, cool, all right. But here's the rub. This is actually super inefficient. And let me show you why. So we're gonna go and take this code and we're gonna go over to the TypeScript playground and I'm gonna paste in that code. And now we can see, hey, it looks exactly the same. But what's really happening here is actually kind of exposed using a different target. So I'm gonna go and change my TS configuration to target, say, ES2015. And now we can see that the reduce method is still there, but now we've got these object.assigns. So what TypeScript is showing us is basically what JavaScript is doing internally but what it has to account for if you retarget it at an older JavaScript version. So internally, as well as here, JavaScript is actually going and creating a new object using object.assign here, every single pass through this reduce. In fact, it's actually doing two, which is probably not the case when it comes to regular JavaScript, but is the case here. And what it gives you is an O N cubed efficiency. Now, if we go back here to ES next, we can see what is actually being run in Node, but conceptually speaking, yes, every single time we go through here, we are creating a new object. We're just copying all of the original object into this new object. So how do we get around this? How do we make sure that we don't actually do that every single time? Well, the fix is actually really pretty simple. So we'll all go and copy and paste this original reduce. We'll start pretty much with exactly the same thing, except we're not going to return an object like that, we're just going to return the lookup. But before that, we are gonna set the key on that person lookup to that person. All right, so we're getting the output that we wanted. And in both cases, we're getting a new object. So semantically, both of these pieces of code do exactly the same thing. There's no downside to doing this secondary version, except that there's a huge upside to it and that it's a lot more performant. So in the case of this first reduce up here, we actually created four objects on the way to getting the object that we wanted. We created the initial empty object, then we created an object that had just this first item, then we created an object that had this first and second item, and then we created the fourth object, which is the one that we wanted, which had all of it. And in this case, down here, we created just the object, just the once, and then we reuse that object in every single go through the reduce. All right, so let's bring up that performance graph that I showed in the beginning of this video and talk a little bit about what this is. So the red line is this algorithm right here, and the blue line that's basically stuck to the bottom of the graph is this right here. And what I've done is basically expanded out this scenario. So instead of having just four people, I had instead had up to 10,000 unique numbers, and then I did a lookup based on the 10,000 numbers. And I did that 100 times per number that we looked at. And 
the horizontal axis shows those different sizes of arrays, and then the vertical axis shows in wall clock time how long that took. So that's in milliseconds. And in all honesty, these are big numbers by the end. 6,000 milliseconds of wall clock times means six actual seconds, and that means a lot. So when you're looking at large volumes of data, particularly when you're doing maybe CLI data crunching, this can have a big impact on the performance of your code. You might not see this as much on the front end where we aren't dealing with that size of array, but when it comes to data crunching on the back end, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you know that you're not just continuously creating objects and really slowing yourself down in that process. All right, so let's see if this also applies to arrays. Hint, it kind of does. So let's go here and look at arrays. So in this case, we've got a bunch of numbers. They go from 10 to 50. And we just want a new array that has those numbers multiplied by 100. Obviously, reduce is not the right way to do this. Map is the right way to do this. But I'm just showing something that's kind of arbitrarily simple so that we can still see that we're creating new arrays every single pass through this method. So we'll do a reduce here. And again, it takes a function and a starting point, and the starting point at this point is an array. So we're gonna have an array coming out the other side, and we're gonna have the value, and then we're gonna create a new array with all of the original array and the value times 100. Let's go take a look and see what we get, and we get the value that you'd expect. Okay, cool but this has the exact same problem. So every time that we're going through this array, we are creating a new array and just copying all of the original items from the original array into it. So the larger those arrays get, the worse the performance becomes and it can get really bad. So let's just compare and contrast this to the push method of this. So we'll take this same code and instead of that, we will return from the function, we'll return the array, and we will just push on v times 100. All right, so let's take a look. And yes, we're getting exactly the same output as we did before. So semantically, there's no difference between these two. You're still getting a new array at the end of both of these reduces. The difference is that in this case, you're just creating one array to get there. And in this case, you're creating essentially six arrays. You're creating the initial one, and then you're creating one new one every time that you go through it. And again, the performance difference is dramatic between these things. And of course, I'd love to see the performance numbers that you come up with by running this on your machine, and you can experiment with yourself and see how that goes. Okay, so how did we get here with this anti-pattern? Well, when ES6 was first released and we got access to all of these great functions like reduce and we got access to destructuring, it looked a lot like JavaScript is moving into the functional programming space. And so people started to use functional programming paradigms within JavaScript, which is sometimes fine, but other times ends up having bad performance impact. And that's the case here. So if you contrast this with say a JVM based functional programming language like Scala, Scala actually has data structures that are optimized for this kind of use. And so you can create new arrays from other arrays and just permute them in small ways like this. And it's very performant to do that because the whole language is designed around that syntax and that style. But JavaScript's not that. And so you really have to make sure that you understand how JavaScript is working internally and optimize your code to make sure that it's not just looks good, but also runs well. Well, I hope this helps you understand this anti-pattern and the impact that it can make on the performance of your code. If you have any anti-patterns to share with me, be sure to put that in the comments section down below. And of course, I'd love to hear your feedback on this one in the comments. Of course, in the meantime, hit that like button if you like the video. If you really like the video, hit the subscribe button and click on the bell and you'll be notified the next time a new blue collar coder comes out.